All right, so this is a summary chapter in Unit 3, and it summarizes a lot of the key concepts we've gone over in the, in the previous lectures. We first talked about carbohydrate metabolism, and then fatty acid metabolism, and then amino acid metabolism, and kind of tying all those concepts together. So much of what we'll talk about in this lecture you've heard before is just kind of tying it all together in a succinct story, so to speak. So this slide just details the energy density of each of the major metabolites. And so the big thing to take away from this is, although carbohydrate is the primary metabolite for the human body, it actually has the least amount of energy density, especially when you compare it to fat, which is you know obviously a major energy store, actually has the highest energy density. So that's two things you wanna take away from that. So in, the, in this lecture, energy metabolism will be presented in the order of most fed, so just after you ate a meal, to the least fed, meaning starvation. And so you know, you'll have the fed state and then starvation over here and we'll kind of walk through as you go from being fed to this point and we'll talk about how depending on the state you're in how the different metabolic needs require that you use different energy sources so you know whether you're just kind of in a early fasting stage and then more towards as you get to starvation which metabolites are used and which energy sources are used depends on you know again wh where you are on this spectrum here one thing we'll point out is we'll talk a lot about insulin. So insul some insulin independent tissues, these are tissues that don't respond to insulin, they don't require insulin. And so one of those is RBCs because they use glucose anaerobically no matter what state they're in. And that's again, partially because of they don't have any mitochondria, so they can't carry out the electron transport chain. And then the brain only uses glucose in all states except for very prolonged starvation. And then they switch over to using ketone bodies. And we'll talk more about that in this lecture. So first here we have you in the fed state. So just ate a meal. And we have these diagrams here that are in your book and they correspond to each of the major states. So we'll walk, walk you through these. So after you ate a meal, your blood glucose levels are gonna be increased. That's gonna stimulate release of insulin. And so the body will then you know, begin taking up glucose in response to insulin and then breaking it down into simpler components. And so you know, you're gonna break down carbohydrates and this is gonna mainly be done through glycolysis. If you ingested you know, some dairy and you have lactose or something sweet, you had sucrose or glucose. Either way, they're all going to funnel towards glucose, which will then be broken down via glycolysis to pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, and you'll get ATP from glycolysis itself. And then obviously acetyl-CoA will enter the citric acid cycle, which will then produce NADH and FADH2 to enter the electron transport chain to give you ATP. So the other thing about insulin is that in addition to stimulating glucose uptake, it actually allows the body to store extra protein, fat, and glycogen for use during a fasting state. So it's going to stimulate glycogen synthesis after you've reached that high energy state. So you've produced enough ATP that the cells are in a high energy state. And so then you need to switch over towards storing whatever's left over for a period of fasting. So insulin will stimulate glycogen synthesis. It also will stimulate synthesis of fatty acids, especially after you've maxed out your glycogen stores. Then you take whatever excess glucose or fats you have and then begin storing them as fatty acids and converting them into triglycerides. And then the other thing is that insulin will stimulate the synthesis of protein in muscle tissue from amino acids. So you, you ingest amino acids and then you stimulate synthesis of proteins from those amino acids. And I know I said in the amino acid lectures that we don't really store amino acids. So a better way to say this is that you insulin stimulates the use of amino acids because proteins have a bigger role than just being stores of energy. They, you know, they serve as, in the muscle as structural proteins and in other organs, they serve as, as structural proteins as well. And so it's more so insulin promotes the use of amino acids to help place broken down protein or just create new structural protein. So now you've reached the early stages of fasting. So this would be the fasting state. And so this would be, you know, let's say you just had lunch and now it's kind of mid afternoon. And so it's a few hours of fasting here. So now the body starts switching over to breaking down some of these energy reserves and glucagon gets released in the fasting state. We've mentioned that before. And that helps break down these energy reserves that were previously stored as a result of insulin. Epinephrine is also released and that helps glucagon also promote the release of these existing energy stores. So the end result of this is that you, know, you, be, you have glycogen breakdown in the liver. At the same time in the liver, you also have gluconeogenesis occurring to help synthesize glucose. And remember, gluconeogenesis in the liver produces glucose to be used by peripheral tissues. During fasting, the liver utilizes fatty acids. So you're using glycogen breakdown, 
then you're also utilizing gluconeogenesis if that if you need more glucose avail- readily available. The other thing is that to carry out gluconeogenesis, you need to break down some amino acids, mainly alanine, as we talked about, from muscle protein. And then alanine reaches the hepatocytes where it's converted to pyruvate via transamination. And then again, that contributes towards gluconeogenesis here. This is stimulated by epinephrine. So epinephrine stimulates the release of amino acids, mainly an alanine from protein. And then it also stimulates the breakdown of triglycerides to give you free fatty acids, which can then undergo beta oxidation to give you acetyl CoA, which can then enter the citric acid cycle and provide you with ATP via the electron transport chain. The other thing is that all of these effects are further strengthened by the fact that insulin would be decreased during the fasting state. All right, so now at this point, we've entered into the early stages of starvation. You know, we've moved from fed state to fasting to now starvation. And so this is the early stages of starvation, short term, you know, one to three days. Glycogenolysis or breakdown of glycogen continues in, until glycogen is completely depleted. You also have gluconeogenesis continuing to occur, utilizing amino acids, alanine, as we talked about, is getting broken down and obviously being converted to pyruvate and contributing to gluconeogenesis, utilizing odd chain fatty acids as part of gluconeogenesis as well. And then also fat tissue continues to be broken down to give you free fatty acids that are undergo beta oxidation, give you acetyl-CoA, again, enter the citric acid cycle. And so as the body begins to deplete these glycogen stores and run out of its gluconeogenic capacity, the body shifts from utilizing glucose to utilizing fats more and more. So you have increased fatty acid breakdown. Now that we've reached long-term starvation, so three plus days, added post continues to release fatty acids. So you're continuing to carry out beta oxidation to give you acetyl-CoA. However, now at this point, you've started using some of this acetyl-CoA to synthesize ketone bodies, which become the main energy source for the brain. So these get used by the brain. The brain switches from using glucose to ketone bodies. And then after fats have been used up, then you begin significant protein breakdown beyond just breaking down some alanine to give you for gluconeogenesis. Now it's more widespread protein breakdown. And this is where the damage from starvation, prolonged starvation begins to occur because you start having muscle breakdown and then you have organ death because the organs you know, are composed of structural proteins as well. And so this is where the body begins to start feeling the real damage of prolonged starvation. So just in summary here, again, as we've gone from the fed state, the fasting state to starvation, Glucose is obviously used first in the form of glycogen and in gluconeogenesis. And then as you prolong through this, these phases here, fats are used next. So you have fatty acid breakdown via beta oxidation. And then eventually you use protein last because beyond just that, you know, breaking down alanine for gluconeogenesis, when you start doing more widespread protein breakdown, that's what occurs last in, in very, very prolonged starvation. Because again, it's the most vital because protein serves such a, an important component of organ tissue structure and function. And so you want to conserve those for last. All right, so that closes out this discussion of integrating carbohydrate, fatty acid, and amino acid metabolism and how they work together during these different states of, of fed state, fasting state, and starvation. Now to have the last lecture of unit three next where we'll talk about heme synthesis and metabolism.